want to uh, thank the Bach Collective for inviting me to this workshop. It's been, for me, a really great day, a very energizing one. Um, and I thank people who went before me because, you know, you kind of plowed the field really well. I don't feel I have to do anything at all. Thank you very much for that. I'm also, this morning, where's Yasmin? She nearly brought me to tears. I was extremely moved, very honored, but also very humbled by what she said about my work. Um, I'm not very often in situations like this where people really take on board things that I write. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's uh, really wonderful. Thank you very much. So this paper that I'm going to share with you today, you can actually read it yourself if you want to read the longer one. It's been published in the journal Ethics and Education. I wrote it with the dean of my school, he's called Damien Page, and you know, it came from a, a very specific location. Everything we write comes from somewhere, right? We, it doesn't just drop out of the sky. Mm -hmm. The location this came from was Damien and I sitting in race equality charter mark um, self-assessment team meetings and constantly listening to the same refrain. It's unconscious bias. The black student attainment gap, well, it's unconscious bias. The lack of black faculty, oh, it's unconscious bias. The white curriculum, oh, it's unconscious bias. So that was the absolute explanation for institutional racism. Institutional racism was never mentioned. Race wasn't even spelt out in that room at all, and it still continues to be the case. So for me, this paper kind of came really quickly out of my body in a way. It, it was for me like a very kind of visceral vomit on the page because I was just absolutely tired of listening to that cover-up, unconscious bias. You know, the cover-up of really egregious institutional racism that we know exists and we know has continued for many, well, too, too many decades, right? So Damien and I wrote this and um, I'll go through the abstract a bit because it kind of kind of says, um, you know, uh, what the paper is about. So I'll start with um, a definition of unconscious bias that's used very much in universities because, you know, we have equality, diversity and inclusion in our university systems and we have the bureaucracies that go with that. And they very much ascribe to this whole notion of unconscious bias. And the definition that they use most is this one from the Equality Challenge Unit, uh, which is also the place where, you know, that looks at the race equality charter mark, mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff that we do and gives us the mark or not. So, uh, so they support unconscious bias. So they say that unconscious bias happens by our brains making incredibly quick judgments and assessments of people and situations without us realizing. Our biases are influenced by our background, cultural environment and personal experiences. We may not even be aware of these views and opinions or be aware of their full impact and implications. What we try to do in this article is to speak against that particular point of view because for us, bias is not unconscious at all. You know, for us, it's, it's as we put at the top there. You know, the un doesn't mean that. It's very knowing, it's very conscious. So for us, there's no such thing as unconscious bias in the way that the ECU and also the equal, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Fraternity would like us to think it exists. So we, we argue against this point of view by saying bias is not unconscious, but is instead unconscious, and it's linked to Charles Mills' racial contract and its epistemologies of ignorance. In the room today, people have been talking about ignorance as well, and is it really ignorant? You know, we really know what we're doing all the time. These epistemologies of ignorance emerge from what the Equality Challenge Unit calls our background. Cultural environment and personal experience, as I've said before. As such, asserting that racism stems from unconscious bias does a really important part of the work of institutional racism. That is, it denies white supremacy. It also maintains white innocence as a will to forget institutional racism. 
In equality and diversity training, unconscious bias has become a performative act to move beyond a racialized reality in where we all know better because we've been trained to participate in a constructed post-racial reality. Of course, we know that doesn't exist as well. What the paper does is it attends to the necessary work of decolonizing unconscious bias, white fragility, and self-forgiveness. We need to do that so that we can begin to see the hidden institutional whiteness at the base of unconscious bias. So basically we just throw unconscious bias out, but we talk about it a bit, a bit before we, we kind of do that. So the argument is this one. For us very much unconscious bias is, is an alibi, it's an institutional alibi to diminish or completely raise any analysis, any recognition of white supremacy. So white supremacy continues to be maintained. An interesting part of, of this um, alibi is what it actually does institutionally, but also to us as people. Already today, people have been talking about silencing, being silenced because of microaggressions. Was it you, Jennifer? Yeah, you said that, didn't you? Being silenced. So for us, um, unconscious biases is a, an incredible political act. It means something institutionally. It also means something interpersonally as well, right? It silences politics. It always maintains white innocence. They didn't know. It was unconscious. We, we, we couldn't help it. It's completely unconscious, you know? You know we didn't mean it, Shirley, right? So, and it's also about a white will to forget anti-black and people of color racism. Because if you say you never meant it, if you say it was all unconscious, racism doesn't exist. Well, you know, why, why are you black people complaining? Would be the next step, which we get a lot, right? Why have you got this chip on your shoulder still, Shirley, right? After all these years, you should know better, anyway. So we have to always think about who, who kind of wins or who gains something from clinging to the idea of unconscious bias as something that can't be helped. Because it's not us, is it? It's not, it's not black people and people of color who gain anything from that at all. Because without the right diagnosis, the prescription will be wrong, right? If we don't go, well, this is just clean racism, then we'll never be able to do anything to kind of tackle this as a problem within institutions. What we do in the paper, we hope, is begin, because it's always about a beginning process, a, a process of trying to get to grips with something, to try and understand it. So that's what we've hope, we hope we've begun to do in this paper, beginning to think about how we can decolonize white fragility, how we can decolonize self-forgiveness, because unconscious bias installs these as institutional approaches to anti-racism until we all know better. Because, you know, if you've been trained in unconscious bias, you, you get to think that there's this post-race reality, as we, we say it, where it's not post-race at all, in which we'll all know better, so we won't make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer Saul, I think she's still at Sheffield University. She used to be, um, she's a philosopher in um, there. She was in the philosophy department. She did her work, a lot of work, on Im implicit bias and stereotype threat and their impact on women in philosophy. And she says, implicit biases are unconscious biases that affect the way we perceive, evaluate, or interact with people from the groups that, are ta that our biases target. She also says, psychological research over the last decades has shown that most people, even those who explicitly and sincerely avow egalitarian views, hold impl implicit biases against such groups as blacks, women, gay people, and so on. This is even true of the targeted group, so women can be biased against women. You see where it's going. Blacks can be biased against blacks. Queers can be biased against queers, because we buy into the system of patriarchy, heteronormativity, white supremacy, right? We are sutured to those systems. We're in them. If you're Foucauldian, that's what you'd say. We exist within these discourses. We use them to understand the world. So the Equality and Challenge Unit, with whose definition of unconscious bias I began, 
use a similar social psychological approach. Now, something's very interesting about the Equality Challenge Unit, for those people who don't know, because you don't know the English kind of workings <laughs> of institutional racism, I have to say, right? I'll tell you what, what it is. Um, it's a registered charity in the UK. It's funded by the Scottish Funding Council. It's funded also by the Higher Education uh, Funding Council for Wales, Universities UK, and from subscriptions in, uh, from universities in England and Northern Ireland. Its mission is providing support for equality and diversity for staff and students in higher education institutions. It provides a central resource and advice to this sector. You can see them describe themselves like that um, online on their own website. So it's quite interesting. They are, we fund them. We fund them as university to, to tell us what to do in terms of the equality, diversity, and inclusion. If this is supposed to be the watchdog, you know, or the person guiding us, then simply it isn't going to work. Because we kind of fund them to tell us what we want to hear. So, of course, unconscious bias comes out of that. I want to go on to um, using Charles Mills' work to help me to think about, or to help us to think about um, viewing unconscious bias as an aspect of the institutionalization of racial liberal liberalism. In case you don't know who Charles Mills is, he's a philosopher, um, I think Northwestern in Chicago, is that right? Yeah? yeah? He's also a Jamaican. Not many people know that. You know, people see Charles Mills, you know, right? I yeah. think he's a white man, but he's not, he's a Jamaican. Right, so the analysis now goes on to show that unconscious bias is a technology of racialized governmentality which keeps the status quo of whiteliness in place within the libidinal economy of racism. This is all the more pernicious because whiteliness continues to be enabled within universities which claim to be post-racial spaces, you know, based on meritocracy, anyone can succeed, we can all rise to the top and be VCs, we know that, don't we? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to move to thinking about unconscious bias and maintaining whiteliness through ignorance. Um, when I've given this paper before in South Africa this year, this is only like the fourth time I've given this paper, so it's kind of still new for me in a way. I, I discover new things about it every time I give it to. Um, um, people in the audience wanted to know why I use whiteliness and not just whiteness. And you're probably thinking the same thing too. That's why I thought, let me just pause now and, and, and say something. Right. Um, I use people racialized as white and whiteness. Uh, in terms of white supremacy, I do do that. But I use whiteliness to show that everyone can be suited, can be sewn into white supremacy. That's why I think it's a more powerful descriptive term of how whiteness and white supremacy works. Right. So that's why I use whiteliness, yeah. And I, di I did some uh, kind of interesting, uh, I made a little discovery about Lee when I was trying to think about why would I use this rather than people racialized as white or whiteliness. And Lee is L-I, it turns out, in the dictionary, it, it said a Chinese unit of measurement. So I was trying to think to myself, so you can kind of judge how much Lee somebody has, you know, how much lean, how much they lean towards white whiteness, yeah, by, by thinking about the things they do. Anyway, so that's why I use whiteliness. So, so the next bit is going to be framing unconscious bias, inequality, diversity, and inclusion training. So I want to pause for a moment and dwell on the un, the un that we've bracketed, the prefix in unconscious. Un is significant because this is where the denial of anti-black and people of color racism is maintained. Un denotes an absence of a quality or state. If you look it up in the dictionary, that's what it says. Like I learned English um, in my school in Jamaica and I'm still learning English, so I always kind of go to the dictionary sometimes to understand what does this mean. Okay, so that's what I was doing with this. So un denotes an absence of a quality or state, a reverse of, a lack of, and gives a negative force to unconscious bias. Un denies the possibility of racist bias and erases the possibility of racism. In contradistinction to this, we have the inscription of unconscious bias with the bracket, which means, you know, it's const the conscious is constantly in play. 
we never erase it, it's never deleted. So we are always constantly pointing to the very conscious basis of bias and the fact that on as a prefix is an alibi to continuing white supremacy. What's interesting about unconscious bias for social psychologists, if you think about it, is they think it's, it's normal, it's, in, it's inevitable, it's only human. It's normal at the societal level for us to have unconscious bias. Racism is a word that is rarely used in the unconscious bias field. And for, for me, that's very revealing um, because racism is not an active choice, it would appear. Instead, racism would be part of being human, an inescapable product of being a member of society. Um, so universities are aversively racist institutions. They're supposedly built on equality. But we know overt forms of racism um, have not been eliminated, even though we are told they have been. Because we can all now occupy the same space. You know, we're not called the N-word constantly, right? Well, what do we have instead, Jennifer? Yeah. Uh, Microaggressions, mm -hmm. which might as well be the N-word big, right? Mm. So racism continues to be uh, talked about in, in terms of inevitable unconscious bias. And most unconscious bias begins from the basis of inevitability and normality. Prejudice is intrinsically within us, and here I think is its first inherent weakness. As well as being a weakness, it is also a problematic barrier for much needed anti-racist institutional transformation, because that's what we're here talking about today, the need for anti-racist institutional transformation. And I mean, this workshop is just absolutely fantastic. It's amazing. Thank you again for organizing it. It's just really great to be in a room with people that you don't have to explain yourself to a million <laughs> times, because we all have the same kind of project in mind, right? Unconscious bias and um, thinking about it as in inevitable and normal is a weakness because it is a problematic barrier for much needed anti-racist institutional transformation because it focuses on the individual and ignores the institutional and the systemic and positions unconscious <coughs> bias as an enabler of whiteliness through assertions of ignorance. I want to go to George Yancey's work. George Yancey is a um, black American philosopher. Um, he describes whiteliness as a social, psychological, I can't say this word, so forgive me, and phenomenological racial reality for white people constructed by an intersubjective matrix whereby white people enact a common being raced in the world, which is seen as utterly benign in its naturalness, but which is nefariously oppressive. White people, people who racialize as white, people who identify as white, you know, for them it's like, that's just regular, it's just natural. But for Yancey, it's also nefariously oppressive. Whiteliness is nefariously oppressive. <coughs> Thus we cannot only label acts committed by openly self-ascribed racists as racist, because racism is not just about believing in the existence of biological races. Getting people racialized as white to let go of such a false ontology has been shown not to ring the death knell for anti-black and people of color racism. The coloniality of white power keeps being recentered because there's no interrogation of whiteliness, of its political, economic, social, imaginative, epistemic, and affective boundaries. This is even the case in context in which we're asked to look at our unconscious biases like in the training programs that we do online. The problem is that such asking does not commit us to delegitimizing those white normative practices, those white normative systems of thought and effective regimes that maintain and recycle anti-black and people of color racism. Asking us to look at unconscious bias doesn't commit us to doing anything. We don't have to do anything once we've gone, oh, that's a case of unconscious bias. We can go, yeah, we know what they look like, what it should be like, yeah, okay. Part of what keeps whiteliness in place as legitimate is what Charles Mills calls the epistemologies of ignorance of racism. You must read the book, The Racial Contract, it's fantastic. Right. Where racism and white supremacy do not exist, or in a particular denial of white supremacy, if racism exists, then black people can be racist too. 
That's the world in which we live, where people don't understand what racism means. Drawing from Charles Mills, Sullivan and Tuana assert that racism's epistemology of ignorance entail that we have a very particular um, anti-racist task. That is, we have to trace what is not known. We have to trace what is not known, and the politics of such ignorance should be a key element of knowledge and social and political analysis. So we have to trace what is not known. We have to trace what has been erased, in other words. So for me, it's about we have to trace the outlines of institutional racism, how it works by the ordinary, the everyday, the normalized as well, because everybody's been talking about that today, you know, and things that people take for granted. So when you say, hey, but that was racism, people go, what's wrong with you, Shirley? He was only joking, or something similar, right, that we're, we've all been used to as well. And if we trace the not known, what we produce is something that has the potential to reveal the role of power in the construction of what is known, and also provide a lens for the polit political values at work in our knowledge practices. Sullivan and Tuana say we should pay attention to the epistemically complex processes of the production and maintenance of ignorance. So we start here thinking about the interweaving of power and unknowing racist ignorance precisely because it enables us to notice that unconscious bias, this one, is linked to power. As such, unconscious bias is also part of the epistemic processes of the production of white supremacy and its concomitant white fragility through its claim to ignorance. I want to look then at Robin D'Angelo's work, just so we know what white fragility is. So Robin D'Angelo um, did, did this kind of work uh, in North America, but I think it relates equally to here and other parts of Europe just the same, and probably Latin America and the Caribbean as well, in terms of how whiteliness operates. White people in North America live in a social environment that protects and insulates them from race-based stress. We have a lot of race-based stress as black people and people of color. We're never protected, but white people can be very insulated from that. This insulated environment of racial protection builds white expectations for racial comfort. People racialized as white have expectations for racial comfort while at the same time lowering the ability to tolerate racial stress, leading to what I refer to as white fragility. White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, guilt, and behavior such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. <laughs> These behaviors in turn function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So you see how whiteliness operates always about shoring itself up in different kinds of ways. And I know that as people who teach uh, race and racism and who actually research on those topics as well and for whom it does matter, we as teachers in the classroom have seen this whole gamut of affect running through the students. Mm -hmm. Silence is a big one massive. You say something and the whole room's quiet. It also happens with faculty members as well. In a meeting you say something and it's like, yeah. So it's about reinstating white racial equilibrium. The institutionalization of unconscious bias as alibi for white supremacy is part of white fragility and thereby unconscious bias reinstates white racial equilibrium. The inevitability of unconscious bias, the very notion providing palatability to discussions of racial discrimination within organizations, facilitates this ignorance. A discussion of anti-black and people of color racism is rarely held in majority white institutions as claiming to be unaware of racism would be exposed as being a lie. It would be exposed to not, not being about a lack of knowledge or information but rather as willfully ignoring racism, a willful and intentional turning away from what whiteliness has produced. This willful ignoring is reflected in the way, for example, 
discussions around the underattainment of black students and students of color, about under underachievement from school being dictated by the racism you experience, right? So, talking about um, the underattainment of um, students in universities here, so like uh, around the black attainment gap, become focused on the deficit of black students and students of color in the form of an interrogation perhaps of whether or not they're commuting students or disproportionately working alongside, alongside full-time study or whether indeed black people and people of color have a different cultural learning style. <laughs> That's a good one, right, you right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, y you have to laugh sometimes, don't you, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, this is how universities continue to maintain a claim to ignorance of how they continue to fail students because of institutional racism. It simply becomes the fault of students themselves. Similarly, discussions around the curriculum argue for the seminal nature of white, male, Western texts that couldn't possibly be replaced or augmented. Whilst data showing that black applicants and applicants of color receive fewer offers of a place than white students. And what that provokes is this um, whole thing about um, let's, let's have a deep dive, let's, let's do more research, let's analyze the impact of socioeconomic status on students instead of looking at race and racism. So it's all a bit about like diverting from what needs to be really looked at. Unconscious bias in institutional context diverts our attention from white power. Also diverts our attention from the fact that we live in societies structured through racial dominance in which the coloniality of power, being knowledge and affect has been dragged into the 21st century. What unconscious bias does it is it enables what Sarah Ahmed would call a declaration of whiteness in which admissions of bad practice become signs of good practice. For our purposes here, we can say that there is a libidinal economy of racism attached to unconscious bias in place in UK higher education institutions. I get libidinal economy from Frank Wilderson's 2010 work. In that book, he sets out the operation of libidinal economy as related to both affiliation and phobia which he claims is as objective as political economy. Somebody this morning talked about social homophily, who was it? Uh, yeah, and how that works in hiring decisions. And people are very attached to that as well, you know, there's emotional investment in that too. Libidinal economy structures psychic and emotional life, and as such is resistant to change, as indeed would be unconscious bias, if you think about it. Because, Wilderson says, libidinal economy functions variously across scales, is as objective as political economy. It is linked not only to forms of attraction, affection, and alliance, but also to aggression, destruction, and the violence of lethal consumption. It is the whole structure of psychic and emotional life, something more than, but inclusive of, or traversed by a structure of feeling. It is a dispensation of energies, concerns, points of attention, anxieties, pleasures, appetites, revulsions, phobias, capable of great mobility and tenacious fixation. This dispensation of energies, concerns, points of attention, anxieties, pleasures, appetites, revulsions, phobias, underlies the construction of unconscious bias as a tool for the erasure of anti-black and people of color racism. We can see this tenacious but mobile fixation of anti-black and people of color racism if we just look at the continuing underrepresentation of black people and people of color in UK universities in leading positions. Erasure occurs through a peculiar kind of social recognition that distorts reality. So white people continue, people racialized as white continue to see themselves as civilized superiors and non-whites as inferior savages. They mightn't use those words anymore, but certainly that's what it means when people say to me, wow, Shirley, you speak really good English. 
Where did you learn to speak English like that? Right? Um, so we have this uh, superior, inferior binary going on. Whilst producing what um, Mills, what Charles Mills calls a collective amnesia about the past of empire, colonialism, and enslavement, right? Such misseeing and peculiar social recognition implicates unconscious bias as a part of the maintenance of such power, especially if we think through the lens afforded us by the racial contract and its epistemologies of ignorance. Mills' racial contract inserts an analysis of the operation of white supremacy within the social contract invented by Western political philosophers. The racial contract and its epistemologies enable white supremacy and its racial entitlements to remain unseen by those racialized as whites. Though, of course, Mills him himself also admits that some of them, some white people do see it very clearly, you know, um, because it's like taken for granted. White privilege is something that's so embodied, it's taken for granted. So, for example, we were talking about students in our group on community <laughs> and support. We are talking about students coming to us, you know, and we kind of try and help all our students and everything like that. But if you, look, if you look at a university which is predominantly white, like I still work in one that's 65% white, the people who most come to our colleagues' doors are white students because they feel entitled to be helped. Whereas our black students and students of color feel that if it's not a black, uh, a black lecturer or a lecturer of color, they're going to ma be made to feel very small. They're going to be made to feel stupid. They're going to be made to feel like they don't understand anything. So therefore, they don't ask for help. They just kind of muddle through and help each other, right? So that's how privilege works. So um, privilege remains unseen by those racialized as white through incantations of unconscious bias. Unconscious bias enables a continuation of white privilege and power as those racialized as whites and non-whites who have been co-opted continue to benefit from the world they have created and maintain. I think, you know, it's really important for us to remember this part as well. I think somebody might have said it already before me, but I'll just say it again. You know, um, black people and people of color can be co-opted by white privilege and fall kind of prey to the seduction, right? Um, and like Jenny really problematized it this morning when she talked about um, the complicity that, the, that is already built into the system of white supremacy. It constantly calls on us to be co-opted. And it's always like we have to think about things that we do constantly to make sure that we don't fall into that trap. It's very easy. You know, the trap of um, somebody makes a racist joke so you have to laugh because you don't want to be outside of the peer group. That happens a lot to students. Um, somebody says something like, um, my student told me, um, uh, why are you wearing a hijab? Are you a terrorist? And she came to my room and she was crying, you know? And everyone in the room was either sniggering or, or kind of too shocked. They didn't say anything, you know? They might have been offended on her behalf, but they did not support her. So. We have to think about the things we do, because things we do have, have, um, have a function as well, maintains white supremacy or it uh, undermines it. Charles Mills' racial contract extends from culture to politics to economy to moral psychology, which he says is skewed consciously and unconsciously towards white supremacy and a differential racial entitlement, that is white privilege, which is simply taken as a given, is taken as absolutely normative. So white people expect white privilege at all times. People racialize as white expect that. So when they don't get it, it produces white fragility, which um, Robin D'Angelo talked about before. Um, norms are also expressed in institutional culture. It's, um, norms are, are expressed through things like uh, recruitment and selection, and processes like curriculum construction. They're not unconscious processes by any means, and they're also not objective. They are processes that maintain the privilege of those racialized as white and non-whites who support whiteliness. Black people and people of color phobia lives on within the libidinal economies of white institutions, organized by trajectories of repulsion rather than attraction, 
by phobic strivings away from rather than philic strivings towards, as Shan Nagai would say. Unconscious bias, therefore, is part of the apparatus of maintaining white racialized power by calling on the idea of ignorance, of not knowing that what is being said or done is racist, because as well it was not willfully said or done to hurt or to discriminate, to be racist. It came from somewhere over which we have no control, the unconscious. Mm -hmm. You can see why you, know, you really have to speak against unconscious bias in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yet, we have to challenge unconscious bias. The challenging of unconscious bias by white institutions and white individuals, people racialized as white, would require challenging the racial contract itself. It would require an acknowledgement of participation within systems of racism that privilege whiteliness. Actually overcoming unconscious bias then requires a motivation to challenge the very system which has provided white privilege, a motivation that intrinsically puts the continuing benefits of white privilege at risk. Consequently, here is where the potential of unconscious bias training within universities breaks down because it risks the benefits to whiteliness that the continuation of the racial contract offers. That's why it just doesn't work. It doesn't do anything really apart from you saying, tick that box, part of my staff development. Here it is then where white fragility and self-forgiveness emerge as key discourses focused on minimizing risk to these benefits while keeping institutional racism in place. This is the next bit. Decolonizing white fragility, self-forgiveness as, as an approach to institutional racism. We have to confess to unconscious bias to move towards diminishing institutional racism. To quote Sarah Ahmed again here, the confession instantiates what she calls a fantasy of transcendence in which what is transcended is the very thing admitted to in the declaration. People can confess because they will not be blamed for wrongdoing because really it's unconscious bias that's the culprit, right? Confessions of unconscious bias can recenter white supremacy by removing blame and its accompanying shame and guilt. Now if you think about blame, shame, and guilt as possi possible areas for transformation, what unconscious bias does is it removes the, the possibility that we can enter into a process of unlearning white supremacy. You can't blame anybody. You can't shame anybody. You, people mm -hmm. mustn't feel guilt because they didn't do it really. Unconscious bias is what done it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> white fragility emerges as vulnerability, anger, fear, for which the only balm is self-forgiveness because you simply did not actively know. Your racism was unconscious. In fact, you don't even put racism. But it was unconscious after all. Unconscious bias begins from the premise of inevitability and normalization, remember, from before. However, self-forgiveness is inactive as an approach to institutional racism because it relies on introspection on the part of the uh, self-racialized as white and also on the part of the white institution. This is what Yancey calls a distancing strategy. So introspection can become a distancing strategy. Unconscious bias is a strategy to distance the self-racialized as white from the charge of racism and indeed that one can be implicated in its very perpetuation. Unconscious bias does this by occluding the extent of white supremacy and its impact on black people and people of color and on white people themselves by focusing on the white suffering that results from irrational claims of anti-black and people of color racism. So of course when we, when we say that was racism, it's always irrational, you know, we have problems like we're angry or something, whatever. We're not quite right in the head or something else, I don't know. Um, Unconscious bias maintains white supremacy and indeed its very definition 
insists that racist culture and environment are crucial to its existence. So it's interesting. On the one hand, you know, racism is important for its continuation, but on the other hand, it, it denies it. Uh, the need to focus on white suffering, white fragility, to say it's not your fault or it's not my fault, produces a paradox at its center where those racialized as whites are victims of the racism from which they themselves benefit. Um, think about Charlotte Rampling. Do you remember the Oscars a few years ago when she was like nominated for some award? And it was the time at which uh, people like Jada Pinkett were saying, we're, we're not going to the Oscars because there are not enough black nominees, mm -hmm. right? And what the Charlotte Rampling said was reported on the front page of the Times, um, these anti-white black racists should just you know, go home and stop spoiling the Oscars ceremony. That's her understanding of how racism works and what it is. These anti-black, anti-white black racists. Okay. The culture of the organization is a zone of suturing of whiteliness to white power and privilege, which is not undone through confessions of unconscious bias. This is so because white supremacy remains stubbornly in place as it is not challenged by the beneficiaries of the racial contract, which as we recall from Mills above can also include people who are not racialized as white. Through an engagement with literature and training in unconscious bias, people racialized as white and white institutions simply feel that they need do nothing at all apart from to confess to having unconscious bias and to have, of course, equality, diversity, and inclusion policies and practices. Here we have the racial contract in action, where white power and white supremacy as the norm do not need to be investigated any further because whiteliness is not the problem. Everybody can be racist, including black people, and we're not white supremacists or have right-wing politics, so we can't possibly be racist. Does that sound really familiar to you? Yeah, it does to me. It's a bit sad, isn't it? Right? There you are. Hmm. The charge of black racism does not take into account the systemic nature of racism, empire, colonialism, indentureship, nor the white constructed racializing assemblages, to quote Alexander Wehiliye's work, that ensure white supremacy, for example. To assert that only self-proclaimed white supremacists are racist is to continue to not see one, one's part in maintaining whiteliness itself. It is only through a denial of, a refusal and denial of this return that such bias can enable a form of thinking which dwells on the question of the unease, the dis-ease, the uneasy feelings the practices, the processes caused by white racism institutionally and personally, rather than erasing them completely through a focus on unconscious bias. We have to dwell on uneasy feelings. We have to dwell on practices that make us go, ooh. We have to also think about processes that just don't feel right. Because doing this, doing this dwelling, could enable us to challenge and address racism within post-race contexts, where racism is seen as only being committed by white supremacists and members of the far right or the alt-right, and black people can be racist too. We need to see white supremacy and institutional racism as problems. And it's kind of like, you know, this is like going back to 1980s speak. Still, we're still there, we've not moved at all. We need to see white supremacy and institutional racism as problems because it is from this bias that anti-racism can begin to reconstruct subjectivities, institutions, knowledge systems, discourses on the human and regimes of recognition. That's it. <laughs>